The storm-driven seas arrive on the west coast of Hoy in winter, fueled by Atlantic winds. The waves pound into the shoreline, seeking submission, and over the centuries have sculpted Hoy's dramatic coastline. Her towering cliffs stand unyielding and weather the storm until it abates and retreats to tranquility. It is late winter and the first snow of the year has fallen overnight. Snowfalls are quite rare on Hoy, being surrounded by a mild sea. These conditions often last fleetingly, but provide a brief glimpse of the island's beautiful scenery, transformed like festive decoration. The barnacle geese, which now overwinter on the island of Switha, come over to South Walls. They drop down to feed near the old cemetery at Ausna, which overlooks the sheltered bay of Kirkhope. The cemetery is dominated by the Longhop Lifeboat Memorial. This bronze figure of a lone lifeboatman was designed by Ian Scott of North Ronaldsea and erected in memory of the lifeboat TGB lost with all hands on the 17th of March, 1969. The lifeboat is returning from an exercise to the old lifeboat shed at Brims. In this sequence, recognition is given to the shore crew who launch the boat and haul her back into the station at the completion of a service or exercise. Geordie Taylor is the head launcher and is responsible for attaching the cable to the lifeboat, whilst Angus Heddle is the winchman. Both have given long service to the station at Brims. The crew dismantles the communications mast and radar and prepares for the wash down of the boat. The boat is made secure and left ready for service. People are gathering for the opening ceremony of the new lifeboat station at Long Hop. There are supporters of the lifeboat, committee members, members of the lifeboat guild, lifeboat crew, coast guard crew and invited guests. A gift was presented to Mrs Norma Marwick, Vice Chair of the RNLI Scotland, who opened the station. Long, Long Hope Lifeboat Station, opened by Mrs Norma Marwick, Vice Chairman of the RNLI in Scotland, 28th June 2003. How lovely, thank you so much. The lifeboat, with a paper aboard, takes a party of guests, including George Marwick, Orkney's Lord Lieutenant, on a trip up the North Bay. In May 2000, as part of their ongoing training, the crew of the Long Hope lifeboat are taking part in a joint exercise in conjunction with the Coast Guard Rescue Helicopter, the Hoy Coast Guard and the Ascent Mountain Rescue Team. 
This exercise is to take place with members of the climbing team acting as the casualties. On their way to the designated site, the prominent landmarks on the Atlantic coastline can be seen. The lifeboat has made good speed and is the first to arrive on site and stands off to await instructions. The radio message is to the effect that the helicopter has been delayed and a decision is taken to launch the Y-boat and check out the base of the rock stack for a suitable landing site for casualty evacuation. Members of the climbing team who are acting as the walking wounded are ferried to the lifeboat one at a time. By now, the helicopter has arrived and is operating at the top of the old man of Hoy, simulating the rescue of a climber who has got into difficulty. For the purpose of this exercise, all the casualties have been evacuated from the site. All that remains now is for the helicopter to pick up the casualties on board the lifeboat. In this well-coordinated exercise, the lifeboat maintains a steady speed of around 18 knots and the helicopter matches her speed. The winchman is then lowered and with great dexterity lands on the deck of the lifeboat. The two casualties are hooked up, winched aboard and taken for medical treatment as the lifeboat heads back to station. Birth and regeneration herald the arrival of spring. As with all the seasons on the island, it creeps in hesitantly. Young animals are eager to begin the race. And the true harbinger of spring, the daffodil, carpets the countryside with colour. In the spring of 2006, there was a special ploughing match held in memory of the late Alan Icebister. The match itself was held in two parts, with the modern tractors competing on land adjacent to the green, and this, the vintage section, being held at the Boo of Aith. The South Walls farming fraternity, who had been Alan's neighbours and friends over the years, were all here on the day. Concentrating hard is Barry Sinkler, ploughing the furrow on his own farm. Until today, Barry hasn't ploughed competitively for 45 years. Also taking part are his sons Andrew on his reconditioned Fergie 135 and Alex is lending a hand. Ploughing uphill is Don Sutherland from Aithsdale in his veteran Dexter. And the remaining local farmer taking part in this group is Ian Robertson from Little Wards, 
who has borrowed this vintage Dexter from his friend Brian Johnston. All in all, a good blowing day and a pleasant reminder of times past. The Crockness Martello Tower is the twin of the one at Heckness and is positioned on the north side of the Sund. The combined defences at Crockness and Heckness were designed to protect the entrance to the safe anchorage at Long Hope, where ships met to form a convoy before proceeding to the Baltic under Royal Navy protection. The declaration of war by the United States in 1812 prompted their construction, which was completed in 1815. This tower is, in general, in a dilapidated condition. Although the walls are sound, the timber work has decayed. Generations of nesting birds have left their mark, with the upper floor encrusted with muck. Historic Scotland purchased the site and an intensive programme of renovation began. The installation of the cannon reminds us that the function of the Martello Towers was to provide a firm foundation for a 24-pound cannon and living quarters for the officer and gunners. Each morning, one of the custodians mounts the steel stairway and opens the door leading into the barrack room on the first floor. Visitors may sign the book and hopefully leave favourable comments. The ground floor contained the stores and the all-important magazine. Now it is the well that is the main attraction and for the price of a coin you can make a wish. The deposited coins are periodically removed, cleaned and donated to charity. Ascending the narrow staircase to the upper open storey, the visitor is confronted with the impressive 64-pounder Armstrong gun which was retrieved from the Caledonian Canal. It sits on a reproduction carriage and was proof-fired on the 15th of May 1996 after it was installed. On a calm day, a party of well-wishers motors out into the Pentland Firth to welcome the return of the lifeboat to Orkney Waters. We've gone east of Swanna. We're going east of Swanna. No problem, what you say to Davy Scott is at the wheel, okay. and making the trip are Erlen Flett, Gordon Muir, Smith Fubister, Billy Sinkler and Archie Williamson. The veteran lifeboat was met off Duncan's Head by the present Long Hope lifeboat and escorted back home. The old and new come up the bay in tandem and as they approach the Long Hope Pier, the RNLI flag is raised aboard the veteran craft, which during her time away from Orkney had been renamed the Pentland Spear. For the crew, it was the end of an epic journey, a long sea passage from Hailing Island back to Orkney. The boat's arrival was greeted by a good turnout of islanders. Posing for their picture, the crew were in good spirits. Billy Mode, Billy Budge, Jimmy Groat, Angus Budge, Fred Johnston and Chordy Taylor. Oh, yeah. 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 Y
Press representatives from local and Scottish stations are here to capture the official relaunch of the Thomas McCunn from a new home at the Long Hope Lifeboat Museum in Brims. After an official photograph, she slides gracefully down the slip and into Eighth Hope Bay. With a party of guests on board, she passes the Cantic Head Lighthouse, making passage for Long Hope. The Long Hope Lifeboat Museum was officially opened by HRH The Princess Royal on the 28th of May 2002. The Thomas McCunn is now the centrepiece of this maritime museum and she made a significant contribution to Long Hope's RNLI history. Between 1933 and 1962 she was launched 101 times and helped save 308 lives. She remains a working vessel and still occasionally puts to sea. There are various photographs and documents on display which tell the story of the lifeboat. Adorning the wall of the museum is a series of oil paintings by Harry Berry, who was a Londoner, but made his home in Orkney after the war. Despite being self-taught, his detailed and dramatic paintings capture the danger of some of the many rescues carried out over the years by the Long Hope lifeboats. It is the summer of 1997 and once again the fancy dress parade is in full swing. This convoy of assorted trailers has left the pier head and is making for the field opposite the old YM building where they will park and set about entertaining the spectators by shaking their collecting tins in the faces of as many people as possible. As expected, some of the floats have taken their theme from television programmes of the day and there's always some item of local news that is worthy of a wind-up. A night at the Bothy gives some of the locals a chance to display their musical talent. This particular group of people are well disguised, but for the sake of simplicity, we will call this lady of the house Anna. The chap shacking a tin of nails is Bertie, and the lad on the knee-tapping spoons is Michael. At the end, on the squeeze box, is Billy. This couple of delectable ladies, or should we say laddies, are called Alan and Robbie. The most topical review this year was based loosely around the theme of the local midgie. As you can see by the antics of the Black Plague, they certainly give a very credible performance as they work their way through the spectators. Concluding our quick tour around the park, we come to the last trailer and on board are the young ladies of the island who have got together to do a skit on the Spice Girls. As always, at the conclusion of the fancy dress, people make their way over to the YM where the queue is already forming for the barbecue and on this occasion the dedication of Karen, Laura and Barry is apparent as they cater for the needs of their hungry customers. Preparations are underway for the annual Long Hope Regatta in 1997. Boats are being rigged, a cup of coffee as tactics are being discussed, and one of the local boats is being made ready to act as a rescue boat. 
At the end of the pier, the windswept race officials make ready for the start. The regatta this year has been blessed with plenty of wind and the boat owners are going to find the conditions challenging. Excellent boat handling skills are in evidence as this boat passes by. Inevitably in these conditions, it's not too long before there are casualties and the rescue boats are called into service. But for those who managed to stay afloat, it was an excellent day sailing. The weather has turned out fine for the annual water sports day being held at the Long Hope Pier. Some of the sailing club committee are busy on the barbecue and doing a brisk trade with these young lads who will shortly be taking part in the raft race. Let's have a look at this motley crew and their craft as they parade before coming under starter's order. This is for chance to study form and gauge the strength of the opposition before deciding who might be the eventual winner. First thoughts are that some weird and wonderful fixings have come off the design board. Of course, the design and construction of these craft is a closely guarded secret amongst the competitors. On the day, the big question is, will it float? Not sure about this one, but it is a nice flag. As the last of the craft are manhandled into the water, we get a chance to have a final look at the contestants. This craft has secreted a dozen eggs on board. What devilish plan is afoot? And just as the contestants are coming under starter's orders, we have our first casualty. They're off, and paddle power is the order of the day. It's difficult to spot a winner at this stage. Will the boozy floozies ever take the occupants of the loony bin? It's anybody's guess, as the craft are fairly bunched together. As the pirate ship gets underway again, and goes underwater for the second time, she is passed by an incoming craft that was designed and built with staying power, and her crew will be the first home. The remaining contestants now haul the rafts back to the beach. On the day, they've all tried and succeeded. Earlier, your attention was brought to one of the rafts having supply of eggs on board. Were they to stave off hunger? Or to be used as missiles? Wrong. They were to be used as an egg shampoo when the malarkey begins at the end of the race. Mel Sitter House lies at the head of the North Bay, and at this time of year, visitors to the chapel are greeted by a display of bluebells in the font. A walk through the wooded area, the trees of which act as a setting for the bluebells in all their variegated colours, is a magnificent display, more so if the sun's rays penetrate the branches and highlight the delicate bell-shaped flowers. Thank you.
The larger of the gloops in this area is on the cliff edge below the farm of Snailsitter. It's not far from here that Orkney's rarest plant can be found. It has survived the Ice Age and is found only on the north coast of Scotland and in certain locations within Orkney. This rare species is Primula scotica, the Scottish primrose. The flower is self-fertilising, ensuring there is some seed production even in harsh conditions. It's found on maritime heath in exposed coastal areas where plants have to be tough to survive the sea wind and poor soil conditions. At this time of year, around the end of May, it's impossible to ignore the intense colour of the gorse which hugs the borders of the banks at Orburn. Complementing the scene is a small herd of highland cattle, which on occasion can be found grazing in and around the gorse. It's noticeable that the cattle are in need of shedding their winter coats. It is fortunate that part of the fast-flowing stream at Millburn has at some time diverted and formed a small area of wet marshland. These conditions are just right for the beautiful annual display of bog bean. This little burn flows down from the quarry known as the Nout Beeld on the road into the Rackwick Valley. It's in boggy patches such as these that insectivorous plants can be found. The butterwort and the sundew derive their nutrients from insects. The sticky secretions on the leaves trap small insects, which are then digested as the leaves curl over them. Nearby are the marsh and heath-spotted orchids, which are so abundant at this time of year. On the higher slopes above the beach at Ratwick, the foxgloves stand proud amongst the ferns, whilst lower down, clinging precariously to the rocky soil, is a patch of flowers called Grass of Parnassus. And on a warm summer's day, these heath-spotted orchids near the cliff edge are set against the background of the old man of Hoy. The Orkney Islands Council purchased the site from the MOD in 1977 and the museum was opened in 1990. The Museum and Interpretation Centre now acts as a repository for the many military artefacts which have been donated or acquired over the years. The images presently on screen were part of the display in 1997. The oil-driven pumps were now back in working order. In former times, they provided the power to transport fuel oil from tankers to the 12 oil storage tanks, each with a holding capacity of 12,000 tonnes. At present, only one tank survives, and this has been incorporated into the museum complex. Large items, which are in a good state of preservation, are displayed in this spacious area, which gives some protection from the vagaries of the Orkney weather. The viewing public has room to move about and is encouraged to enjoy a hands-on experience. Near the top of Weefia Hill, which overlooks Linus, stands the imposing HQ and communications centre for the naval base. The building was strategically placed to monitor and communicate with the ships approaching Scapa Flow through Hoy Sound and the Pentland Firth. With the completion of the HQ in 1943, all the defence sectors in the flow were now in direct contact and the 270 staff handled 9,000 calls per day. The remains of the bracket that held the 20-inch projector still exists on the roof of the building and it was from this vantage point that the Wrens used the projector to contact the capital ships as they entered the heavily protected waters of Scapa Flow. 
The underground oil storage facility built inside this hill was completed in 1943. 400 workers were involved in the construction phase to provide six tanks with a holding capacity of 100,000 tonnes. Access to the tanks is by tunnel, one on each side of the hill. To the west of Linus is the Grand Fleet Cemetery, beautifully kept by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. The Commission looks after two and a half thousand cemeteries, which pay a lasting and dignified tribute to the 1.7 million men and women of the Commonwealth forces who died in the two world wars. The Commission is firmly of the belief in honouring all casualties equally, taking no account of rank, race or creed. There are graves of service personnel who died at Jutland, on HMS Hampshire which struck a mine off Marwick Head at Bursley, on HMS Vanguard which exploded whilst lying at anchor off Flotta, of the German personnel who were killed during the successful attempt to scuttle the German Grand Fleet interned in Scapa Flow, of crew from the sinking of HMS Royal Oak, and of the German air crew from World War II who died when their plane crashed at Pegel in 1940. There are still some stark reminders of the Second World War, as Scapa Flow was one of the most heavily defended areas in the United Kingdom. The twin six-pounder guns provided protection for the boom defence system, which ran from Houghton to Scad Head. The well-worn treads on the wooden ladder lead up to the director tower, and from this vantage point there is a panoramic view of the flow. Below the tower is the gun emplacement, and on each side, below the cliff face, are the searchlight houses. This battery remained operational until the end of the war, and on a care and maintenance basis until 1950. This battery continues to maintain its lone vigil of Oshkapa flow. The 60th anniversary of VE Day was celebrated at the Linus Museum. The Kirkwall City Pipe Band and a delegation from the British Legion were in attendance and they entertained the crowd on what was a very blustery June day. People congregated inside the museum to meet and renew old friendships. The museum shop and cafe did a brisk trade and people were entering into the spirit of the event by posting their first day covers in the improvised post box. Two celebration cakes had kindly been donated and these were ceremoniously cut by Charlie Miller and Dave Rendell to officially mark the opening of the day's proceedings. As part of the entertainment, this Romney hut had been earmarked to act as a stage for a concert given by members of the Kirkwall Amateur Operatic Society. While people gathered for the first of two performances to be held in the afternoon, the guests listened to the strains of music being played by the Kirkwall Grammar School Swing Band.
The performance began with a radio broadcast by Winston Churchill, who was talking about the unconditional surrender by the German High Command, bringing a welcome end to the war in Europe. songs were the theme of the day, and to reenact the moment, the audience was invited to sing along. Looking over the valley from a vantage point above the glen, this scene of peaceful tranquillity is about to be disturbed on a Sunday morning in the month of June 1997. A dedicated group of people is gathering to make ready for the start of the race known as the Hoy Half Marathon. <laughs> promises, promises. <laughs> Many who take part do not do so with serious intent. Competing in fancy dress would certainly count as a challenge, whilst others will be raising money for organisations by sponsorship, and yet again many will be simply having a fun day out. This event is now firmly established and attracts participants from near and far. Most of the competitors on the lineup are known to each other as they have been coming here for years with the intention of giving their all over the gruelling course. On the command, ready, steady, go, they are off. No fancy technology here. The seriously fit athletes are away and in just over an hour the leaders will have reached their goal. For the many, however, they check their watches and start off in good heart, pondering maybe that this year they will better their previous best time. The finishing line is at the North Wall School, and here the event organisers and helpers are working like a well-oiled machine. As competitors' times are registered and lost body fluid is replenished, the day is drawing to a close on yet another successful hoy half. Visitors to the island take the clearly signed cliff-top path that will lead them to the symbol of the island, the towering sandstone sea stack known as the Old Man of Hoy. This is a well-trodden path leading up over the hill to the moorland owned by the RSPB. This is an area of the finest scenery and it supports a variety of wildlife, including a huge colony of bonxies. The skewer is very, very protective of its nesting site, especially if there is a young chick on the ground. 
Observers approaching the nest site should be aware that they will come under a determined attack by the parent bird. It's not surprising that so many people are attracted to this scenic spot. From the cliff edge, the 137 metre high old man is fully revealed. This rock stack consists of a sandstone pillar standing on a solidified flow of black volcanic lava. The sailing times of the ferry between Scrabster and Strumness are well known and people sometimes wait for the ship to pass to capture the moment on film. From this viewpoint looking south is Rora Head, and then to the north at St John's Head, presently shrouded in mist, are the highest sheer cliffs in Britain. Moving about, the visitor will discover that not only does the rock stack change its shape, but also its mood, depending on the quality of light. As the mist clears, the rock face is bathed in evening light, highlighting the colours of the sandstone. Let no tongue idly whisper here. Between these strong red cliffs, under the great mild sky lies Orkney's last enchantment, the hidden valley of light. Sweetness from the clouds pouring, songs from the surging sea. Fenceless fields, fishermen with ploughs, and old heroes endlessly sleeping in Rackwick's compassionate hills. So said George Mackay Brown, and how apt, since Rackwick was a place he loved dearly. People come here to picnic and play and take part in all manner of outdoor pursuits. It is a playground sculpted on a grand scale. Over the centuries, these beautiful patterned sandstones have been shaped by the action of wind, sand and sea. And the sandy beach, which is exposed fully at low water, seems to go on forever. People will always be drawn to this very special place with its ever-changing moods and its restless sea. Lying below the Dwarfy Hammer on a remote hillside is a great block of red sandstone. The Dwarfy Stone is the only Neolithic rock-cut tomb in Britain. This giant boulder was hollowed out using hand-held stone tools over 5,000 years ago. A short passage was cut into the stone, leading to a square chamber with a cell on either side. Outside the entrance there is a stopper stone, but again there is a hint of mystery, as there is another boulder about 30 metres away, which has also been shaped more carefully into the shape of a stopper stone. Among the many names carved into the stone is an inscription in Persian which translated reads, I have sat two nights and so learned patience. It was carved by a major Mounsey in 1850 and he also carved his name backwards in Latin. Major William Mounsey was a British spy in Persia and Afghanistan. Above the valley a hawk falls, mountain hair, torn flesh, rowan red. The genius of these few words is the vivid picture it paints in the mind's eye, for to the permanent inhabitants of this harsh and rugged landscape, it is all about survival. 
The trail leads away from Rackwick through the glacial valley to the fragments of the ancient native woodland of Orkney that still survive in the ravines of some of the Hoy Burns, especially at Berrydale. This small wood is the most northerly in Britain and comprises birch, rowan, willow, aspen and hazel, with an underlayer of rosa and honeysuckle and a ground flora of ferns. It is probably identical to the scrub which must have been widespread in Orkney before the arrival of Neolithic man. In the wood there are about a hundred mainly multiple stemmed birch trees. As you go down into the ravine, across the burn and heading upwards, you come across the sole surviving hazel tree, which is large and thriving. It is on Hoy that the true colours of autumn are displayed. At Pegel, the rowan tree is ripe with berry and the burn is in full spate, running with the peat saturated water from the surrounding hills. Downstream, the water is held briefly in a dark coloured pool before meandering to the sea. The beautiful valley of Rackwick was once one of Orkney's most isolated spots. In 1801, there were 101 people living in 21 houses, but now there are only a few permanent residents, with the bulk of the houses being holiday homes. Now closed for the season, they are only to be occupied on an occasional weekend. For this community, which was in danger of slipping into decline, there is now rejuvenation and optimism for the future. As the autumn light spills over, enhancing the beauty of the valley, it would be a fitting tribute to George Mackay Brown to quote from his very first publication, entitled Let's See the Orkney Islands. But the fairest region of all Hoy is the valley of Rackwick, which lies shut in with mountains on the northwest of the island. Many say that these few acres are the loveliest in Orkney, and indeed, on a still summer evening, with invisible larks spilling enchantment into the valley, the magic of Rackwick has power to bind a man's heart forever. <laughs>